It is said that Allah has sent 124,000 prophets mainly for two reasons. One was to introduce himself to the creatures of the worlds and the second was to spread the message of truth so that society could come onto the right path. We have heard about the age of ignorance, but what really does it mean? According to one interpretation, the age of ignorance doesn't mean that people were uneducated in that era. In fact, there were highly skillful poets, artists, businessmen and rulers before the advent of Islam. The age of ignorance could be interpreted then, therefore, as when people were educated but they were not on the right path or in other words, they were distant from Allah. In that case, the role of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was to gather people towards the truth and show a way forward to the people of his time and the generations to come. It would not be incorrect to say that some people have not only misinterpreted Prophet Muhammad's sayings for their personal gain and ego, but they have completely missed out traits of the Holy Prophet's personality when talking about him. As a result, the Holy Prophet is mostly remembered as a ruler of a religious monotheist state. No doubt there is no question on his sacredness, but people fail to also focus on his generosity, kindness and compassion. In this film, we look into his personality and discuss his greatness, ethics and morals. The Holy Prophet was a unique man compared to other men of his time. Uh, you have a great akhlaq. The conduct of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was benevolent, was kind, was attractive, was considerate, and this is what we find out in many examples. Muhammad Mahdi, in his book, Ethics of the Prophets, has used almost 21 adjectives to define Prophet Muhammad's personality before his prophethood. He writes that he was trustworthy, truthful, ingenious, eloquent, learned, pious, devout, generous, moderate, modest, and patient. What makes the difference between his morals and the time during time he was existed is he was always taking care of each and every human being and understanding the people and according to the perspective levels he used to go, his approach was. And uh, he never ridiculed anyone, he never abused anyone. Even those who were not agreeing with him, he has always considered them as human being. So human values at his peak. And we have a prophet who grew up in such a society where war was a pastime, where there was no government or law. He had a different view of society. In the pre-Islamic world, terrible acts such as adultery, theft and exploitation of the poor and women were rampant and somehow acceptable. For if he had not come and not taught the society at large about the correct code of conduct, then perhaps the Arab world would still have remained Bedouins who were shepherds and they probably would have cancelled each other out with their endless wars and killed each other if not physical destruction, they would have definitely had, have had a moral destruction indeed. The Holy Prophet campaigned for women's rights to live and urged the Quraysh to respect their daughters and raise them as they do their sons. The Holy Prophet وسلم, was a miracle himself for the people of Arabia. For he brought them from an era of ignorance of jahiliya to an era of enlightenment. The light that he brought into their lives meant that those who killed for the sake of tribes. So looking at pre-Islamic time, it is accurate to say that even before his prophethood, his morals were of exceptional standards. He was at his esteem morality, the highest moral values. 
Rabb al Adim, Rabb al Adim, he is saying, the greatest of the great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, his morals were Adim. Indeed, the message of kindness has existed in all three Abrahamic religions. Prophet Moses and Prophet Jesus both taught their followers to be kind with human beings. Prophet Muhammad carried forward a similar message but with more authority as he was the seal of all the prophets. It is reported that during the Battle of Uhud, four of his teeth were broken and his face was badly hurt. Seeing his injuries, the companions of the Holy Prophet cursed the perpetrators and the Holy Prophet responded by saying, I was not delegated to curse people, but to pray and be a mercy for them. O oh God, guide my people, for they do not know the truth. The people of Quraysh did everything to humiliate the Holy Prophet. They sent people to harass him, publicly humiliate him, they hired people to insult him in public, and worst of all, they tried to assassinate him. However, instead of being angry and offended by this, the Holy Prophet carried a divinely guided attitude which prevented him from getting angry with anyone. Why people became closer? Although when he started message, he was, message, he was alone. No one was there in Mecca. Almost all of them, except few people of his family, majority were non-believers. And all of them, they were abusing him. But always he smiled. Always he has taken care of their needs and taken care of their values and never radical anyone. In fact, after the conquer of Mecca, Prophet Muhammad gave amnesty and forgave the people of Quraysh. His standard manner was to forgive. Even those who had wronged him severely, for example, the, the killer of Hamza, when he came to repent, the Prophet forgave him. Anyone who had wronged him, I mean, the example, the best example is when we, he conquered Mecca and he forgot all those things that the Meccans had done uh, uh, to him, humiliating him, fighting him, killing his relatives, kill, killing his loved ones. He forgave all of them. The Holy Prophet was exceptionally tolerant when it came to his enemies. One issue was blasphemy. There are two dominant traditions of which one says that the companions of the Holy Prophet would take out their swords whenever someone tried to humiliate or insult the Prophet. And the second tradition says that the Holy Prophet barred companions from doing any harm to these blasphemers. The majority of historical accounts state that the Holy Prophet used to pardon blasphemers. He once he said to his followers, Allah ukhbirukum ba ashbahikum li khulqan. Do you want me to inform you who is closer to me in terms of akhlaq amongst you? And they said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. One of the things that he said was that, Ahsanukum afwan. Those of you who forgive more, who forgive better. In regards to non Muslims, the Holy Prophet had always showed utmost respect for people of other faiths. When the Prophet wrote letters to non-believers, to non-Muslims, to kings around the world, he wrote it with due respect. When people of other faiths came to Medina to listen to the message of Islam, to listen to the message of the Prophet, we have the stories of how Prophet treated them. When the Christians came, Prophet allowed them to pray in his mosque. Prophet allowed them to, uh, to to, to rest there, to and the way the Prophet actually spoke to them, the way he, the, the dialogue went between the Prophet and them was very respectful. Slavery is a disputed topic amongst scholars as there is no straight or categorical answer. However, the concept of slavery is totally different from the Western world, where race determined one's fate. Well, the concept of racism, where a society was making money on enslaving people, when people were being sold in thousands and shiploads and sold and then given to their children. Human beings were a commodity. To tell people, not only are you going to stop selling people and buying people, 
but you're also going to consider that person with a different skin color. You're going to consider that person an equal, an equal to you. The person who sits beside you, shares with you, is considered your brother. Why? Because a man is elevated simply by his conduct. He set the men and the women free from slavery, from all of its manifestations, whether it was a physical amount, a kind of slavery or a slavery to our desires. At many places, Islam has prohibited to keep slaves and encouraged to free them, including both Muslim and non-Muslim slaves. Moreover, it was Islam that gave equal status to servants and considered slaves as human beings and not a commodity. He never distinguished who is what, who is not. He considered all human beings are equal. Similarly, he was highly compassionate when it came to orphans. Perhaps he could relate to them, as he himself became orphaned at a young age. Regarding the orphans, I don't think in the history of humankind we have anyone advising and instructing others regarding the rights of orphans than Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon and then the, and the Quran. Anytime the Quran advises us to benevolence, one of the instances that the Quran mentions is about the orphans. And also the Prophet himself was orphaned at a very young age. His father was, uh, did pass away before he was born and his mother passed away after two years. And the Quran tells the Prophet, uh, Did not Allah find you an orphan and he protected you, he sheltered you. So do not oppress the orphan. Furthermore, mistreating your parents or elderly was very unacceptable to him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, respected people, not only respecting the old age people, not only respecting the, the elderly, respected people who respected their parents, who respected the elderly people. Muslims were a weak force in the beginning. They didn't have weapons, enough horses and proper swordsmen. So they moved to Medina, which was known as Yathrib at the time, in order to avoid direct confrontation with the Quraysh. The first battle they fought was Badr and it was one of the greatest upsets in the history of war, in which a weak and small side defeated an opponent force which was almost three times in size and comprised of highly skillful fighters. Nevertheless, the Holy Prophet instructed Muslims to be kind to the prisoners of war. So the Holy Prophet introduced a new way of dealing with prisoners of war. Uh, at the beginning, wars started. One of the things he asked, if they are knowledgeable, their duty is to teach Muslims their knowledge. Whatever knowledge they had, whatever uh, technique they have, whatever abilities they have, the, he asked them to teach and in order to teach, for example, five, ten Muslims in order to go, get free, you teach them and get free. And the rationale behind these rewards was to assimilate them. After harming the prisoners of war, he wanted to use their, their potentials, first of all, to be integrated in the Muslim society for a while by teaching 10 people how to read and, and, and write. The big difference between the Holy Prophet's treatment of prisoners and others was his perspective. During that time and even today, whoever fights against a regime, empire or state, he is considered an enemy of that state. As a result, prisoners who attack regimes are treated inhumanely. But Prophet Muhammad never considered those Quraysh who were attacking him as his enemy or enemy of his rule. He saw them as misguided individuals who needed guidance and not wrath. The Asir, those who had, uh, to, had come to fight Muslims in battles, they were not regarded as purely evil. They were not regarded as people who had to be eliminated, eliminated completely. Of course, there were situations 
uh, armies came and fought against each other. But afterwards, they had to be treated humanely. They had to be treated in a way that they found a light in their heart as well to follow the guidance. So according to historical accounts, when Muslims captured prisoners after the Battle of Badr, it is said the Holy Prophet instructed his people to serve food first to the prisoners of war and then to the soldiers. Yatim is orphan and asir. A miskin comes to at your door, you give it away. A yatim could be coming at the door, you can give it away. Asir is not going to come at your door. Asir means those who are have been captured in the war. And this household used to go to them, reach out to them and treating them. Many, many people, those who came to as a Asir POWs, they changed to Islam. They, they become Muslims because of his teaching, his approach, his love, his kindness. The Holy Prophet had a deep love and compassion for children and understood child psychology. Uh, children, they are, their psychology, child psychology is a great subject nowadays. If you go to you visit any friend's house, children of that house, they don't come to you until they know you are safe. In order to break that distance, our blood Prophet Muhammad used to smile on them. First, salam. Always he was first in greeting the children. Everyone, but in, in regards to children, he was very careful. And giving a lot of importance and listening to their what they are talking about. And also there is a hadith from the Prophet who says, Tasabu ma'asibiyan. When you interact with children, you have to behave in a childish manner, speak like them, behave like them, so that to, to make them happy. Having good uh, conduct with the children is a, is a sign of mercy of Allah, is a sign of mercy of the heart. Moreover, he never undermined the importance of children. I will narrate one story. He was uh, go, uh, going with, uh, with companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the children, they were playing on the ground. They said, O Prophet of Allah, we are two groups, we are playing. A teams, can you watch us? And they started watching the game. And one of the companions said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, we have important meeting. Prophet says, the best important is this meeting. That shows in order to revolve the future, we have to focus on the children. In another historical account, it was also reported that a man appeared when the Holy Prophet was playing with Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. And the man told the Prophet that he had 10 children, but he had never kissed them. In reply, the Holy Prophet said to him, It is not my fault that God has taken the roof of mercy of your heart. The Holy Prophet had sons, but they died at an early age. The love for Lady Fatima was not because she was the only one who survived, but there was a spiritual connection between father and daughter. The Prophet's treatment of uh of Lady Fatima is, uh, is very exceptional uh, in two ways. First of all, the respect that the Prophet had for Lady Fatima due to her spiritual status was, was huge. And this was mentioned and shown in many, many instances. And the second thing that this relationship uh, tells us is the way the respect the Prophet had for females in general, whenever Prophet peace be on her visited Fatima, he used to kiss her hand. Kissing her hand, as I said, has two aspects. One is to respect her spiritual status, and the other to teach others that females are respectable. They have to be respected no matter whether they have a social position in those days or they don't have a social position. They have to be respected due to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. The Prophet, peace be upon him, for six months used to go every day to the door of Fatima and give her a special salam when he was going to the mosque. And uh, he, he used to say, Fatima to bad'atu minni, man adaha faqad adani, wa man adani faqad adallah, Fatima is a, a, a part of me. Fatima is part of my heart, by part of my, my, my person, and whoever mistreats her has mistreated me. In fact, putting Fatima on an equal status with himself. With respect to his wives, the Holy Prophet had set high standards to treat them. 
there is a hadith in which the Holy Prophet said, The best of you are those who are the best to their wives, and I am the best of you to my wives. The Holy Quran allows up to four marriages, but the verse which mentions this also issues a warning to believers in verse 3 of Surah Nisa. But if you fear that you will not be just, then marry only one or those your right hand possesses. That is more suitable that you may not incline to injustice. One interpretation of this could be that Allah has allowed us four marriages, but He knows that not all men would be able to treat them all equally and therefore this would result in injustice. The Holy Prophet was an exception to this and he never took his wives for granted. First of all, he did not burden uh, any of his wives with his own personal matters. He used to mend and fix his clothes, his shoes himself. He used to do every personal, uh, uh, all his personal jobs himself, not burdening any of his wives with it. Similarly, he never mistreated any of his wives. There is not even a single hadith referring that Prophet shouted uh, at any of his wives. He mistreated anyone, although he was sometimes mistreated by his wives, but the type of reaction was a kind and benevolent reaction. There is a deep misconception that Prophet Muhammad was sent only for Muslims. The Holy Quran in general mentions that the Holy Prophet was a guide or light for all of mankind. He is not only merciful to humankind, he was mercy for entire universe. This shows that the Holy Prophet didn't come as a light for this world, but for all known and unknown worlds. Muslim, غير Muslim, Yahudi, Masihi, Hindusi, Sikh, Buddhism, Hindus, all of them. Moreover, his mercy was not restricted to humans only. It is beyond that. He did not only advocate the rights of human beings, but also mentioned different living things. When we see the history of our blood problem, he gives instructions not to slap on their face, not to slash on, the, on their face, and not to be harsh. Feed them properly. I'm talking about animals. So that approach is kindness, rahma, mercifulness, compassion is the unique in regards to other prophets. The akhlaq of the Holy Prophet was extraordinary. Even before the declaration of his prophethood, he was called Sadiq and Amin for his truthfulness and honesty. The second phase of his greatness started when he was appointed as the Holy Prophet. Thereafter, the Holy Prophet was guided on every step. So one can say that the manners and the behavior of the Holy Prophet was actually an example set by Allah for people to follow. As I said, the Prophet is the example of how the Quran advises a person to behave. And when the Quran tells him, you have a massive, great akhlaq, it means that he is following exactly what the Quran tells us. For example, the Quran told, tells us to be patient, was sabirin. The Quran tells us to be honest, was sadiqin. The Quran tells us to be charitable, wal munfiqin. The Quran tells us to uh, to swallow our anger, never show our anger, wal kadhimin al ghayth. The Quran tells us to stand before our Lord and ask forgiveness in the early morning, wal mustaghfirin bil ashar. The Quran advises us to repel evil with good. The Quran advises us to be good to everyone that we meet. And all these you can just see in the example of Prophet's life. After briefly looking at his life, one thing is quite evident, the violence, hostility and aggression were not a part of the Holy Prophet's manners. In fact, these were the traits of his opponents. When we hear about Prophet Muhammad someone said bad, we react so harshly, we burn the flags, we do so many things. We know not to do. Knowledge, knowledge-based approach. Love-based approach. Knowledge means only with knowledge you can change the public. Only with love you can, you can change the public. You cannot change with... The answer to the harshness is harshness. It's nothing, there is no such a thing. Answer to the harshness is love.
نحن لا بد أن نتعلم من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم أخلاقنا تعاملنا مع الأهل ومع العيال ومع المجتمع ومع أولادنا ومع أصدقائنا ومع جيراننا نتعامل نكون بتعامل بخلق حسن والعفو عن المسيء. There is no space for hatred and hostility in a person who claims to be a follower of the Holy Prophet. Those who misquote and twist history to support their internal or personal bigotry against fellow Muslims or even non-Muslims should know that their claim is directly in contradiction with this verse of the Holy Quran and to the principles the Holy Prophet lived by. And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to the worlds.